43. If you would turn your Bible to Isaiah 43, verse 18. This message has been burning in my spirit for a time now. And over and over again when I asked the Lord what to minister on, He would constantly remind me of this scripture. And the title of my message this morning is, Behold, I will do a new thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. This is a promise that God has given us this morning that we can cling to, that we can hold on to. It's in the word of God, and I believe the word of God stands true and that it's unshakable. And I'm believing that this just isn't a word for me personally, but this is a word for the body of Christ. Amen. That God wants to speak to us this morning. And just as kind of an opening, I was scrolling through Facebook and Pastor Torrance Nash, I don't know if oh, any yeah. of you know him, yep. but I love Pastor Torrance and his preaching. But Pastor Torrance had to come from somewhere. And his mother is a woman of God. And I was scrolling through my Facebook and I seen something she wrote that had to do with my message. And it said, you will not just survive in the wilderness. You will thrive in the wilderness. You're not, see, God isn't putting you through whatever you're going through so you can just muscle it out and tough it out and survive through it. He wants to cause you to grow. He wants to cause you to thrive and prosper in the place that he has you in now. So in Isaiah 43, 18, it says, Remember you not the former things, Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. You shall know it. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Our God is a way maker. He's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. And I came to talk to you this morning a couple points. One, remember the former things of old. Remember the faithfulness of God. What he's already brought you through. What he's already done. Because he doesn't change. His character stays true. And he's going to come through for you one more time. And then one more time. And then one more time. And it's going to get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. He said, consider the things of old. That means carefully consider these things. Remember his faithfulness to you. And he says, behold. See, he wants to reveal his glory. But we need to get in position for him to reveal his glory to us. Then he says, I do a new thing. Greater deliverance is yet to come. So don't think that the place that you're in now is the place that you're going to stay. So don't set up camp and pack a meal and stay there. Because God wants to move you forward in the things of God, in the work of God, and in your life. And sometimes we can get so overwhelmed by our circumstances that we start setting up shop right in that area. But God doesn't want you to stay in that area. He wants to move you forward. You You shall know it means that God's fingerprints are going to be all over it. His anointing is going to be upon it. It's going to fall into place. You will know it. And nothing will stop what God wants to do. Nothing. Nothing's going to stop his plan for your life as long as you continue in faith. So the chapter of Isaiah 43, it's the purpose. It's your purpose in God's greatness. What God wants to do with his people. And I love this. 
that it displays God's love, God's grace and his power, despite Israel's frailties. Think about that for a moment. So many times we get caught up looking at ourselves and our own frailties and our own weaknesses and our own shortcomings. And Israel even refused to repent. But God said, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up one more time. I'm going to show up one more time for you. And God begins to draw his people, Israel, through the circumstances that we're facing. See, that's the same today. God's drawing us closer to him. Now, you have the choice to run to him or to sit in other things. But God is drawing his people. In scripture, it says, no man come to me except the father that has drawn him. The Holy Spirit is drawing. And even Naya said he's calling us to come. He's calling us to come. There's a whisper in the spirit. And you can even hear a roar if you're really listening that he's calling his people to come to him. But sometimes the Lord has to chastise those he loves. And that's what was going on with Israel at the time. They refused to repent. So God allowed them to be in captivity, to teach them to turn towards him. Sometimes we get so caught up in life that we can tend to forget the Lord and tend to forget to go to him and tend to forget to run to him, tend to forget the former things of old and, and we don't turn to him. But God chastises those he loves and chastisement means to train, to educate, to discipline and to chasten. When you were growing up, did you ever have your father and mother spank you and say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you? Well, I was thinking about that, and I was like, when Jesus went to the cross, it hurt him more than it hurt us. But he went for the joy of the Lord that was set before him. He knew that when he endures the greatest chastisement of all for our sin penalty that he took on himself, the greatest chastisement, that we were going to be set free because of that. I believe that that hurt him more than it will ever hurt us. God wants to get rid of the old man and bring in the new. See, but when we come to the Lord, we, sometimes we feel like everything is going to be perfect. And it's not. It's not. And everything's not going to just fall into place. And there's circumstances and situations that draw us. And the Lord kept reminding me, Angela, this is not unto death. But for the glory of God, what you're facing is not unto death, but for my glory. Amen. So I was like, okay, Lord. This is me and the Lord talking. And we're, I was like, the children of Israel were in captivity at that time. And they must have felt like they were going to die in that circumstance or in that situation. They were hungry. They were desperate. But they still refused to turn to the Lord. So I began to think about, God, you're so gracious and you're so merciful and you're so kind and you want your glory to be revealed. So what do we need to do, Lord? Well, we need to turn towards him and believe. See, but I began to think about the story of Lazarus because sometimes we can get mixed up in a circumstance or even a sickness or even a death or something that's going on. And we can see it with your natural eye. Yeah. That's what we usually see with. We see with our natural eye instead of seeing with eyes of the spirit and what God wants to do. And in John 11, it says, Jesus heard that he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God might be glorified. What is our condition when we're faced with unprecedented circumstances? When you turn a corner in life and we get hit with something that we never expected that was going to happen, right. what is our reaction to what we are facing? Well, there was two that I can see even in this story of Lazarus that Martha was cumbered with many things. See, that 
I tend to be Martha. Just put myself out there. Martha was cumbered with many things. And cumbered is perseo, and it means to drag around. So, see, God is allowing this circumstance to bring him glory, but instead, Martha is worrying and anxious, and she's dragging around all her problems all day long. Can I get a witness? Because I know, okay, that I'm not the only one that goes to work with a mind full of things that I'm worried about, or what I gotta take care of, or what's going on in my family, or how can I fix this, because I'm a fixer and I wanna fix everything. But I can't fix anything. You can't fix anything. Only God can do what he said he was gonna do. And she holds on to all these things, and ultimately it distracts her from the master's capability to be able to do what he can do. That's right. She needs to put her eyes back on the character of God. But then there's Mary. But in the it says Mary, it says she had one thing that was needful. Mary chose the good part, which shall not be taken for, from her. What did Mary do? That one thing need is chera, and it means it is a demand and a requirement. Hmm. It is a demand. Not an option that you sit at the feet of Jesus. That's right. It is a requirement that we sit at the feet of Jesus. Or we are going to run around like Martha and not be able to enter into the rest of the presence of God. Amen. And it says that she sat at the feet of Jesus and that it won't be taken from her. Sometimes we just got to stop and sit down. Amen. And sit in the presence of God and let him renew us and refresh us. Therefore, his sister sent unto him and said, Lord, behold, who you love is sick. I'm using this as an object lesson in case you're not following me. But Lord, who you love is sick. See, sometimes we think when we come to the Lord and because he, he loves us, that we're not going to face things. Mm -hmm. But the scripture says, Lord, who you loved is sick. We are going to face reality and real life, but thank God I can remember a day that when I lost my dad, I didn't have Jesus. And all I could run to was the things that I knew to run to. And I and then when I lost my grandfather, the grace of God carried me through that. And I remember, thank God, that I am in, living in this world where I'm going to face reality, but I have a hand to hold on to. I have something that is constant, that never changes, that is faithfulness remains. Lord, who you love is sick. Yes, I, God loves me. You're loved. If you're facing something, don't feel like God has forgotten you and you are not loved. You are loved. But how are we going to face it? Don't live in a false reality. So many times we feel like following the Lord can be like a fairy tale. But it's not. He's testing our faith. He's testing our belief. Will we trust him? Faced with destruction and despair, heartache and oppression and sickness, will we trust him? And Manuel, can you hit the screen for me? That's my dog. <laughs> you're like, Angela, what does this have to do with it? <laughs> okay, so I'm sitting in my bed and I'm eating sherbet, okay? And scratch that from First Fitness, okay? But I'm eating sherbet and my dog is sitting there staring at me. His name is Samson. So I leave some at the bottom of the cup. Okay, we're talking about faith here. We're talking about digging deep. We're talking about trusting the Lord. And I turn over the cup to him and he sticks his nose in it and he starts at the top but then he realizes he's not getting the best part so he digs deeper and I have like frame by frame like the deeper he got I wish I could have set it up but he goes deeper and deeper and deeper into the cup until he gets to the bottom of the cup and I was like man and my cup says this is great I got this God and I said, Lord, you are so faithful. The, the, the more you dig, the more you get into the presence of God. And deeper that you dig into the promises of God. You better believe Samson got to the bottom of the cup and he got everything he needed. And that he wanted. Not just what you need. He got what he wanted. And he just looks up at me with a face full of sherbet. But he was as 
your faith. Children of Israel's faith was shaken in the wilderness. And when Jesus heard that he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, they believed and what was the result of their faith? I'm talking about coming in from the old man and going into a new man. See, he wants to do a new thing. But in order to do a new thing, you might have to let go of some of the old. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm preaching to myself. Some of those old things that we're used to reacting in. So, I have an object lesson. So if I can have Elijah, please come forward. And you guys are probably like, man, Angela, we got a dog. Now we got a mummy. Okay. Come here, Elijah. Jesus called Lazarus forth. Pastor Matt? Pastor Matt is going to play Jesus for a moment. Since he did so good at the last object lesson, I had to get him back. So Jesus calls Lazarus forward. Go ahead. Come forth, Lazarus. And he moves forward. So, yeah, we were in death and hell and destruction. And Jesus, at one time or another, called you up yeah. out of sin, God, yeah. out of the grave, okay? Just like he did with the children of Israel. He called them up out of Egypt. But Lazarus. And if you don't know what that word means, 
It means that he wholly sets us apart. Yes. You are holy. At the moment of salvation, when you are placed in Christ, you are completely sanctified. You are set apart for the glory of God instantly on the moment that you say yes to Jesus Christ. But there's not just an instant sanctification. There is a progressive change that needs to constantly be taking place in our lives. Well, Angela, how can that happen? As you begin to believe what Christ afforded you on Calvary, the Holy Spirit has 100% free reign mm -hmm. to change you. That's right. That's good. To work in you. As you continue to believe and trust in Jesus, the grace of God, the power of God has the legal right to move freely in your life. So I began to study this out in this chapter. See, the sanctification process begins on Isaiah 43, 1. It says, but now thus says the Lord that created you, O Jacob, and that he had formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. So I started at but now. But now, what point in time was this? But now, when the children of Israel were stubborn and ignorant and refused to repent, God chose that time that he was going to show up. Well, praise God for his grace and mercy, because I don't know how many times I was stubborn and going in one direction, and the Lord said, but now. I'm about to change your course. But now, I'm about to come through for you. But now, my grace and mercy is going to reign in your life. The results of them refusing to repent was total defeat and the end of themselves. And they found themselves rejecting the light. The Bible says as we reject the light, the light rejected is light removed. I'll say that again. If we reject the light, the light will be removed. And I'm not just talking about rejecting Christ in general. I'm talking about when he reveals things to you. Right, right. As he begins to reveal himself to you and reveal things to you, we need to receive the light. That he could take out the old and put in the new. Because he wants to do a new thing. It says, but now thus says the Lord, the covenant keeping God. So, so many times we're in this process and we feel like we can't trust him, but he wrote his covenant in his blood. Why can't we trust him when he has his best intentions in mind? He has our heart in mind. He has his ways in mind and our best interest in mind. But then it says, who created you, O oh Jacob? And I love that because he goes from O oh Jacob to O oh Israel. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, you have an old man that needs to be done away with, O oh Jacob. But he is the God of your struggle. So even if you're struggling, he's still your God. So don't believe the lie of the enemy when he says that you can't struggle and be a Christian. Because you can. But God wants to do a new thing and give you victory over that struggle now and today. He said, who formed you? See, created and formed are two different things. Formed is your star, which is a squeezing and a shaping and a molding. If you feel like you being, you're being pressed, <laughs> you probably are. And the potter's at work. That's right. And he's molding and he's shaping and he's forming you. And he's forming you, oh, Israel, which is your new man and your new life in Christ. Then he continues on to say, fear not. 365 times in the Bible, it says, fear not. So every day that you wake up, you can wake up with on your mind, fear not. Fear not. Whatever you're facing, fear not. I have called you. I want an individual encounter with you. And you are mine. You are mine. So I was like, okay, Lord. So you want to take us from the old and bring us into a new man. So how are 
Well, if you follow scripture, it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. So, that tells me I'm going to be going through some, some waters. Some troubling waters. But God opened up the Red Sea and said, Stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. And these Egyptians, what you see, you shall see forevermore. You will not see the struggle that you're facing today anymore. God wants to completely extinguish what you're facing this day. Also, I'm going to face some rivers. So I began to think about the Jordan River and how God told Joshua, go and possess the land. Have you ever been in a circumstance where God told you to go do something and then you set out to do it and you realize there's giants in the land and you don't want to go through that? Well, God said, go possess the land. They had to step in the river before the river would part. But see, we have to take a step of faith sometimes, not knowing how it's going to end up. But it said that the ark of God, the presence of God, went before them. See, the presence of God is going before us in life. It's going behind us. It's surrounding us. So sometimes we just have to take a step of faith and believe God. And the waters parted. Again, God was faithful. But I feel like God was doing a work during this time. If you had 50,000 horsemen and 200,000 footmen and chariots following behind you, don't you think you'd be doing a work? Mm -hmm. Think about that. I would be scared, but I'd be running forward in the things of God. I have this dirty Jordan River and God's telling me to step in it that I might drown and I don't know what's going to happen. But the presence of God is going before me. He told me to do it. Then you're going to walk through some fires. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't bow down. I refuse. I refuse to bow down to the passing pleasures of sin. I refuse to bow down to the things of this world. But you know what happens when you take a stand like that? The fire gets turned up seven times hotter. And that's exactly what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Don't you think when they stood before the king and they knew what they were about to face, that God was working on them, molding them, shaping them, pressing, pressing them. God was doing a work in them. But they said to the king, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. And to translate, that means there is no need for me to answer you. Sometimes when people are coming against your faith or the things of this world are coming against your faith, there is no need. That's right, that's good. There is no need. There's no need to argue. There's no need. Amen. Just let God prove his faithfulness. Because he said, there is no need, but God shall deliver us. But even if not, I will not bow down. I'm not going to bow down. And then I loved it later on in scripture. And I'm, I know I'm taking time on this, but I thought it was needful because this is a progressive process of sanctification and some things that you're going to face in life. And you need to know how to handle it biblically according to the word of God. I need to know. And they're in the fire, but then it says that the fire had no power over them. Nor was a hair on their head singed, nor were their coats changed, nor was a smell of fire passed on them. The fire has no power over you. The enemy has no power over you. The sin nature has no power over you. The flesh has no power over you. The world has no power over you. Ungodly bents that Jesus still needs to fix in our hearts have no power over you. So don't believe the lie when the enemy comes in that you are being dominated. Because right, right. a lot of times it's just outward oppressions. And God wants to give us 
victory because he was faithful, faithful, faithful over and over and over again to Israel. If you further on in scripture in Isaiah 43, he says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I remember the one time I was going through something, the Lord said, uh, Angela, I am your God. Ooh. And I literally was in worship and I was like, it just hit me. Like, I don't know where I was before, but uh, he got a hold of me and said, Angela, I am your God. Like so many times we look at preachers and pastors and even the person next to us that seems to be worshiping better than us and the worship team and the teachers and whoever else is around you and you compare yourselves amongst ourselves and we don't get it. But he got a hold of me that day and he said, Angela, I'm your God. I'm your God. The same thing I did for Moses, I'll do for you. The same thing I did for Joshua, I'll do for you. The same thing I did for Lazarus, I'll do for you. The same thing I did for Mary. Get, he is your God. He is your God and he will fight for you. He went further on in scripture. And I love this. I just had to keep going because it was so good. It says, Isaiah 43, 13. God declares his promise to Israel. Yea, before the day was, I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Before the day was, I am he. Before the day came that you even were facing what you're facing today, he is still God. He is still your God. He still wants to turn it around. The one who can bring you through the waters, pass through the river, and through the fire. He is still your God. The one that can reach out with a mighty outstretched arm is still fighting for you. So when you walked in this morning and you didn't feel like God was fighting for you, he's fighting for you this morning. And then it said no one can stop what God is going to do. If he can express himself in such a way that he would send his own son to die on the cross, because that's how much he loves us, how much more would he do today? He says, I will work and who shall let it? I will work and who shall stop it? He's going to work. He's going to work in your favor. He's going to work. And he says, who shall stop it? Nothing is going to stop what he has for you. Then it says, God declares who he is. He declares who he is in Isaiah 43, and I'm not going to read them all, but I want you to see who he declares himself to be. He declares his promise, and along with his promise, he reiterates his character. Mm, yeah, that's good. See, God is going to give you a promise, but that promise is going to be tested. Mm. And when it is tested, you have to remember the former things and remember his character. Because yeah. yeah. his character doesn't change. So his character, it, it says in these verses, I am your redeemer. I have set you free from sin. I am the holy one. So he is perfect and upright and without sin. You are in him. You are in him. I am the Lord. That is your covenant keeping God. He does not break a promise. He is never early and he is never late. He is always on time. I'm your creator. That means he's all powerful and he's all knowing. I am the way maker. I am your king. And I remember I was going through something one day. Yeah, I go through a lot. And, and I know you do too. And, um, but the word of God stands true. And I read it's in Psalms somewhere. I'm not too sure. You can look it up. But it says, I am the king of your flood. He is the king who, you know, it said, sits upon your flood. I was like, man, that's good stuff. Like, he sits upon your flood. You're overwhelmed and all this stuff is going on and Jesus is just sitting on it. He's just ruling it and reigning it. He sits upon the flood. 
He is your king. He is my king. I am your deliverer. That which stands in the presence of God is extinguishable. Everything that stands in the presence of God must bow. That's right. Must bow. Nothing can stand in the presence of God. And he says, Behold, I shall do a new thing. Remember you not the former things of old, nor consider the things of old. Former in the Hebrew meant a beginning place. I think sometimes we tend to forget where we came from. Yeah. We tend to forget what we went through. I tend to forget being on the streets of Atlantic City when I face something. I tend to forget yeah. God's great delivering power. But he said, remember those things. Remember that. Because I'm ready to do it again. I'm ready and I'm not just ready, but I'm able to do it again. He said, neither consider the things of old. Considered in the Hebrew meant to separate mentally and distinguish with understanding. See, sometimes we need to take the lie and bring it to the truth. Yeah. Yeah. To mentally separate what the truth and the lie is. See, consider those things. Get understanding. Walk in resurrection power. Because when you look at what God has already done, it points you to his capability again. And again. Amen. And again. And again. Amen. And he promises that what he is about to do is greater than what you have ever experienced in your life. That's good. Amen. He says, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. You shall know it. And I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Behold is low, and it means to see. He's going to make your faith sight. It's not, when, it's not if he's going to make your faith sight. It's when he's going to make your faith sight. He will make your faith sight. Whatever you have believing for, your family, your friends, healed relationships, healing inside, healing of your body. I don't know, because what you're believing for might not be what I'm believing for. But God knows how to meet all of our needs at one time, in one room, in one moment. That's how powerful he is. And he said that he is going to make your face sight. He said this to me. I believe the word of God. That he is going to make my face sight. I will see it. I will experience it. And it will be made real. And if you want to come along with me and believe with me, then get on board. Because I'm going to believe God that I'm going to see what he wants to do in my life. He said, I will do. That means to make. If God has to make it and create it again. Just for you, he will. He will make it. He will do it. He will intervene. He will do it, it yeah, says. Yeah. Though your efforts may have failed, yeah. God is about to accomplish what he set out to accomplish. Hallelujah. And it said it's going to be a new thing. Yeah. It's going to be a fresh thing. It's going to be a refreshing thing. Thing. It's going to be an unexpected thing. It's going to be something that's going to be a suddenly in your life and it's going to knock you down and you're going to be like, how did I get this? How did I end up here? How did my family come back together? How did I get up again when I was knocked down a hundred times? It's going to be a refreshing. It's going to be a new power that you never had before to walk this thing out. He's going to do a new thing. And then I love this because it said now. I was like, well, what better time than now, Lord? Let's do this now. Let me get in your presence now. Let me lay hold of it now. Let me believe now. Because so many times we face things and we're like, I'll sit in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. I'll go to him tomorrow. I'll do that. No, now. Now. He wants to reveal himself now. Today is the time of arrival. So get ready. Buckle in. Because he wants to do it now. All things are beautiful in his time. Then it said, it shall spring forth. It 
Isha spring forth means it's going to blossom and it's going to grow. And it's going to be birth of God. The Holy Spirit, whatever you need, it's about to be birthed of God. And he's going to bring it forth. And when God births something, it's eternal. When God births something, it is everlasting. And it will not be shaken. And you shall know it. It's going to happen in your life. The anointing and power of God is going to be all over it. Naya, if you would come. It's going to be all over it. And it's going to be undeniable that it's God. And how is he going to do this? Well, it says at the end of the scripture, I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. And I'm going to, I'm going to make rivers in the desert. So I don't know if you're in a wilderness this morning. I don't know. 